do want to leave uh, a lot of our time to individual questions that you may have because this is our last session together. And so we're going to do a little bit of a review. We're going to put it all together. Um, I had been asked for a specific example a couple of weeks ago with Hebrew in terms of translating a, a prayer. And so I wanted to use it. It happens to be a good example of a lot of the things that we've built toward. And so that's kind of the idea here. I hope to finish my prepared things somewhat quickly um, and then really be able to open it up so that, you know, if you have things that we haven't covered, um, if you have things that we have, but you want to review a little bit, or if there's, um, you know, any anything that you're curious about uh, where to look to move forward, um, you know, there's, there's going to be space on today's call to address those. So I'm going to share the screen. And once again, I'm going to do it the way that I have found works nicely in terms of large size. Okay, so here we go. So this this is our, our sixth and final session of reviewing Hebrew. Just again, as a recap, if you're wondering what you have and have not accomplished um, in this series, you know, from the start, we were never promising uh, fluency or actually expressive language in any way, but very much receptive language. So how to understand it better, how to read it better, um, how to pronounce it better, not necessarily how to generate uh, words yourself, how to create a conversation. The main reason that we <clears throat> focus in this class on conversational Hebrew is because I just don't think it's an achievable goal for the platform that we're using. So, um, you know, for me, when people ask, how do you know Hebrew so well? I mean, I grew up in a house where we spoke Hebrew. I went to Jewish private schools where <laughs> friends and teachers spoke Hebrew. It was very much alive and well in my life. And it was helping me connect with people who I cared about. And that's what language is built for, is communicating and connecting with people who are important to you. And so it's a very, very difficult <laughs> thing to become conversational on a class that looks like this. Um, you know, a limited course, doing it only once a week. When I have taught in religious schools and Hebrew schools, one of the things that I would often kind of preach as my example of the importance of having uh, people at home or in your life to communicate with, but also just regular learning, I said, you know, give, give me 10 hours, uh, excuse me, give me 10 minutes, four days a week, and I will do a better job of teaching conversational Hebrew than if you gave me double that once a week, right? So if you gave me four or five days a week, five to 10 minutes, it's going to be much more effective than an hour or two hours or three hours once a week. And again, the reason for that, it's like playing an instrument or anything like that. It's repetition, it's practice. You've got to really feel it and, and become one with it. And so for our Hebrew class, I, I know I had a couple of um, participants early on who had said, oh, we hope to, you know, we hope this helps us navigate our way through whether it's visiting Israel and talking with your cab driver or whatever. And um, unfortunately, that's not that has not been our goal. And so I'm, I'm very comfortable that we have not achieved that goal. Um, but what we did set out to accomplish in these kind of short six weeks is understanding how Hebrew works, kind of taking the teeth out of it, making sure that we understand that Hebrew, like any language and, and most ideas, actually, Hebrew has a life story. And what's fascinating and interesting about this period of time that we live in is, number one, as people engaging in Hebrew at any level, whether it's conversational or occasionally in a synagogue or a temple setting, we are a part of that life story of Hebrew. And so in the same way that we sometimes feel, um, many of us sometimes feel inept when it comes to Hebrew, when we hear Hebrew and we feel a little insecure about it, um, whatever our Hebrew comfort is, we are very much a part of the life story of Hebrew. And the other thing that makes this time of life exciting when it comes to Hebrew studies, but also biblical studies, is I don't think that people really appreciate how much recent archeology span and science has benefited us in understanding the Bible and ancient Hebrew um, in a way that was not accessible more than 200 years ago. And so there are actually a lot of things that we know nowadays that were not known previous to today, and we're still discovering things. So, you know, the, the one of the big finds of the 20th century was the Dead Sea Scrolls. These are a collection of scrolls found in and around Qumran, around the Dead Sea. And 
the Israel Museum and other researchers are still digitizing those texts, still preserving those, still deciphering them. And so we're constantly learning new things. And even outside of Israel, and this goes back to our original, our first session together, is that Hebrew is very closely related to other languages that were spoken in the ancient Near East around the same time. And so one of the things that we have benefited from, and we're gonna talk about this, I think on maybe our last or second to last slide today, is that our discovery and understanding of other writing systems and our deeper understanding of those languages has also benefited Hebrew. And so I don't think that we live at a time where we know everything that there is to know about ancient Hebrew, the development of Hebrew or the Bible. And these, the science is still evolving and unfolding. And I, I always find that very exciting. I think for a few thousand years, whatever we knew about Hebrew was what we knew about Hebrew. And now we're really discovering new things and finding out, um, you know, one of the things that we'll talk about at the end is how to navigate Hebrew dictionaries. And one of the things that's really interesting is that um, a lot of dictionaries that I grew up using and studying with um, are no longer really the, the uh, pinnacle of Hebrew studies because they haven't been updated to incorporate new things that we've discovered and learned about Hebrew and also uh, languages like Akkadian, Ugaritic, things like that. So just going over a kind of a, a quick review of things that we've done. You know, in our first session, we talked about the origins of Hebrew, the development of the language, and also of writing. We talked about the consonants, we talked about the, the letters of Hebrew and how originally Hebrew was a spoken language and later a written language and that there was no uh, vocalization system. There were no vowels, there were no dots, dashes, anything to kind of help a reader uh, interpret the language. One of the reasons that that didn't exist was because it really wasn't necessary. So one of the things that we highlighted in our first session was that the people who are speaking Hebrew and other similar languages, Aramaic and Akkadian, Ugaritic, um, they, they pretty much understood how the system worked. Everyone was talking in a very similar way. People could generally speaking understand each other, probably even if they were speaking other languages, the sounds were very similar. Over the course of Jewish history, as not only Jews stopped speaking Hebrew and were spread around the world, we started to lose those vocalization traditions. And so it was only about a thousand years after the destruction of the Second Temple, about 500 to a thousand years after that, that this series of scribes, these Tiberian Masoretes, started creating vocalization marks, the, the trope sounds, uh, the, you know, the markers, the cancellation marks that you would uh, chant as you are reading Torah nowadays, the dots, the dashes, the things that really help us pronounce Hebrew. And what's interesting about that is that that system developed way after the language. And so um, they were kind of figuring out the rules of the organic language and then codifying them. And so we do have, especially in, in biblical Hebrew and early rabbinic Hebrew, a lot of really clean rules because they were essentially taking a language that was frozen in time, that was organically developed, and they were figuring out these very uh, sensical rules that were put onto it. Over time with modern Hebrew, you get more influences of languages like English and German and French uh, that just didn't really make much sense with Hebrew. Um, and so now the Hebrew that we speak is still a very grammatically rigorous language, but um, it's a little bit harder to figure out sometimes than ancient Hebrew, which is why that's mostly been the focus of our class. Um, we talked about how every Hebrew word can be broken up into syllables. Each syllable is defined by having one true vowel. So the shiva or those chataf vowels are really not true vowels. And so those don't count. But generally speaking, when we think of vowels, we think of true vowels without the shiva. And that defines a syllable. And the consonants kind of get uh, sucked into the vowel system into that syllable. And that really helps stressing the proper syllable is one of the things that makes Hebrew sound quote unquote correct, um, as opposed to someone taking, let's say in English, a very different uh, accent and a very different stress uh, and applying that to Hebrew. It can be a little, it can sound a little odd. It can be sometimes a little off-putting. 
And the key thing that we've talked about, this is kind of the big idea when it comes to not only Hebrew, but also um, Arabic and Aramaic and ancient Near Eastern languages, uh, these Semitic languages, is this idea of a, of a root, of a three letter root. It's three consonants. And from that you can build a tremendous diversity of words and meanings out of just a few simple roots. And so when we talk at the end about biblical dictionaries and things like that, you will see that they are often organized by root, which for a person who doesn't understand that system can make it very difficult to find the word that you're looking for. But it actually makes it very, very easy, not only to find the word that you're looking for, but also to understand its potential meanings and seeing what else is related to it, what other words are related to it. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more today about prefixes and suffixes, but we did cover that. We talked about the vav conjunctive and the vav consecutive. Um, and we talked when it comes to verbs, we talked about how verbs have a person, a gender, a number, and they also in biblical Hebrew have aspect that's imperfect and perfect. So the nature of an act, is it completed or is it incomplete? Um, that eventually turned into a tense system of future and past, uh, because usually an action that is not yet complete is in the future and an action that is complete is in the past. And so biblically speaking, that also generally holds up to a modern Hebrew understanding, but there are exceptions to that. And so in the modern world, we just found that tense made more sense and wasn't that big of a deviation from aspect. Um, and then the last thing that we talked about last week were these binyanim, these verb constructions. And again, when you understand the roots, uh, the root system, you understand binyanim, and you understand uh, prefixes and suffixes, that's essentially, those are the essential tools of understanding Hebrew. And so just knowing that you have some level of comfort or familiarity with those concepts is going to make future Hebrew learning much, much easier, even if it's not intuitive yet. You know, all of these things take practice to identify and also to use. And I wanna take a little bit of a, of a, a break from what we uh, are going to be talking about just to address, I think it was Jerry actually who, who asked this question and I, I thought it was worth um, showing and also the next slide um, I find funny. So, you know, we'll start with a little bit of a humor break too. But um, one of the things that makes reading Hebrew very difficult is the fonts. And this is true of English, but we're much more comfortable reading English and we're much more comfortable seeing English in many languages. Um, I think uh, Fran might have mentioned that some Sidurim, some prayer books, are much easier to read than others. And uh, it was a good question that was posed is how much of that ease of reading has to do with the design of the font and how much just with our familiarity with the font. So if I highlight a font like this, for instance, on the left here, the second from the top, um, that is a very difficult font to read. The uh, uh, You've got a very crazy contrast between of, of thicknesses there, and it makes it very, very difficult um, to read. And so even if you were familiar with that, that would be a harder Hebrew to read than maybe the one above it or next to it. Um, and I also wanted to highlight one more font, which is in this middle column, the third from the top. And that is a very, very different, it's not really a font, it's a totally different script. And so that's what we would call, um, it's a, a font of what we would call Hebrew script as opposed to block letters. Um, and, you know, I would, I assume that most Israelis um, write naturally in script. That was how I was taught. That's how my dad writes and my mom writes. You know, we, we, we write with a script, but we read printed books uh, that are in the blocks. Oh, I was yes. taught with script as well. And Were you? Oh, that's yeah. That's how I would write. Awesome. Oh, and by the way, I want to correct myself. I was listening to myself talk, and I think, Fern, I totally mispronounced your name. I'm so sorry. Okay, I think I, I, I answer to Fran. No, 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 no. I'm so sorry. I'm, hold on. I need to grab my coffee. This is. It's okay. It's okay. I was, I was listening to myself, and I was like, I think I, it was, it was like last week when I was messing up the Vav conjunctive and the consecutive. I was under caffeinated. I'm sorry. I like the the bottom the bottom right font the best. Is that this one here? The bot yeah. Is that the um, conservative nineteen sixty font? It's very it's very similar to it. Um, it's a little less blocky, um, but but it is very similar to it. And again, you know these uh, all of these fonts I pulled off of um, 
kind of my graphic design software. And so, you know, they're all trying to look a certain type of way for whatever design you're doing. And I do sometimes play with it. Um, but two fonts that I did not include on here, one is the Torah scroll font. So the, the scribal fonts that we're used to seeing in a Torah scroll, if you were to open up, for instance, your mezuzah on your door and you were to unroll the, the cloth, the scroll that's in there, it's a, it's a scribal font. There is a slightly different tradition between um, Jewish communities. So the Ashkenazi one looks a little bit different from a Mizrahi one, from a Temani one. But generally speaking, you have a crowned font um, and it's a very formal, a very intense uh, calligraphy tradition that we have. And then the other one, which I also didn't show here, um, I apologize, I couldn't find it in a way that I could add onto my software. But if you have studied traditionally, if you've studied Tanakh with Rashi, you'll, you'll see what's often called Rashi script. And um, it's a very different font from the script that we're used to, it's very different from uh, block letters, from, from script writing. It's really its own uh, font. And I think a lot of people are sometimes confused. They think that Rashi wrote in that font. And it, it was really not that. It was that the, the printer created a typeface specifically for his works because it was so important. And so in the way that you have uh, a different font, you know, you could recognize the inside of a Torah scroll, that font pretty clearly. Um, it was important for people. There was this massively influential Torah commentary. And so um, I think it was the first Hebrew Bible. I could be getting this wrong, I, I, but you know, I'm sure Wikipedia has an answer to it. Um, the first Hebrew Bible that was printed on a printing press was printed alongside Rashi's commentary. So that is an example of how important Rashi's commentary was. And, um, you know, you wanted a different typesetting. And so that became called Rashi script um, is that font. Um, and here we get, uh, I think, I think Jerry mentioned um, street signs in Israel. And, you know, like we just looked at, you have so many different fonts. Israel, I feel is it's a very Israeli thing in my mind to just have kind of like everyone printing signs in different fonts. There's nothing is standardized. How they write things in English isn't standardized. It's just kind of like a free for all signage. Um, and so you'll notice that some of them, like in the, the top right and the bottom left, will have vowels, which makes it really nice and very easy for us to read. Um, but others do not have vowels. And you can see the difference between these street signs uh, that are these road signs pointing you in the direction of different city. It's a much blockier, um, much squarer type of font as opposed to this Sokolov street, which um, I actually really like this font a lot. I would love to be able to download that onto my computer. Um, but you know, you have all of these, these different fonts. And the one funny thing um, that uh, I won't embarrass anyone by asking anyone to read this, but I think it's important. This is my favorite street um, to bring children to, kids to Israel and, and to watch because uh, don't worry about the English. I don't know how this guy's name is pronounced in English, but here it really helps you in the Hebrew, his last name, um, by giving you vowels so you cannot mispronounce the intention in Hebrew. This is Penis Street. Um, and it's just, and, and sometimes you see it in English spelled like fines, sometimes pines, pens, you know, all, I don't know what it is, but you know, you bring a kid to this street and they know how to read the vowels and you show them this sign and they go, there's a penis street. And you say, there is indeed a Yechiel Michel penis street. And so I just always find that, um, amusing. You got to always find your, got to find joy in Hebrew wherever you can. And so just going back to kind of the big things that we've, we've talked about and kind of some of our big takeaways, um, the keys to understanding Hebrew. One is that um, with the right teacher, it, it does make sense. Um, and, you know, I've had a lot of Hebrew teachers, good and bad, and I've definitely felt the pain of a bad teacher. Um, and I've also felt the joy of a good teacher. And all of a sudden, when something makes sense in a new way is really exciting for me. Um, and so, you know, I, I want you to know that if someone is explaining a Hebrew concept, and, and by the way, that could be me, right? If, if someone, including me, is explaining a Hebrew concept and it does not make sense to you, it is probably not you. It is probably not the language. It is probably the teacher. So Hebrew does make a lot of sense. And I wanted to illustrate that as clearly as I could throughout this time. 
Um, one of the things that I, I, I know in a, the marketing materials I wrote that we could not promise anyone is to undo the trauma of bad Hebrew teachers. Um, I still think that I walk around, I think last week I, I talked about how, um, you know, I'm, I'm very self-conscious when I travel to Israel and I get off of the plane. It usually takes me a few hours to feel comfortable speaking. I think that's just the trauma of bad Hebrew teachers, of probably some friends who are jerks, um, probably some total strangers in Israel who are jerks. And so, you know, we can't undo any of that, but, but I hope this at least is a step in a positive direction when it comes to Hebrew. Well, Yoni, I want to say something about accent because I, I, I agree with you and I don't. Um, I think if you speak the language with a certain degree of fluency, people will understand your accent. But I can remember sitting in Paris at a, at a you know, a rest, an outdoor, you know, patio, restaurant patio and listening to a woman trying to order something in French. And she wanted um, melon, but the special of the day was Merlin, which is a fish. Oh, and no. she, her Merlin, her, her melon sounded to the waiter like fish. And so she was too far away for me to go over and help. Um, but the waiter didn't get it. And he brings out her fish and she goes, no, 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 um, that isn't what she wanted. Um, and so that, you know, her accent created a problem for the waiter. I'm not, you know, she didn't accept the fish and say, never mind. Um, but you have to be able to speak in sentences. You can't use isolated words. Yes. And, and I, I agree with you where, and, and I actually think you're standing on a lot of strong footing, especially when we're talking about Hebrew in a religious setting. Um, Maimonides, um, who brilliant guy served a lot of people. I don't know how nice of a person he was um, if you actually spent time with him, but he um, wrote his code of Jewish law and he, he touched on laws of reciting the Torah. And um, one of the things that he said, he goes, if you can't distinguish between an Aleph and an Ayin, if you cannot distinguish, if your accents cannot distinguish between a Chet and a Chaf, if you can't distinguish between these letters that are meaningful, have meaningful differences, if it sounds the same, he basically said you cannot read from the Torah. Now, he actually, in my view, also kind of contradicts himself because later he says that if um, your accent is so foreign to the community in which you're reading that it's distracting from what you're saying, then you also can't read Torah. So, you know, the way that I think of that is if your community speaks with an accent that um, does not distinguish between these letters, if I were to start getting up um, and reading Torah in a very thick um, Sephardic accent, um, it would be distracting and people would would stop realizing that I was reading Torah. They would just be like, oh, this sounds interesting. And so I think that's something, you know, I have learned one of the reasons why um, melodically um, I've had to learn so many different trope systems is because every synagogue that I've ever worked at uses a different trope system and they want me to teach their students. And I, so, I, you know, I, I know like six different Torah tropes, and then there's the Haftarah, and then there's Megillah for Purim, and there's Eicha, and there are all of these. And, and I, I don't know if I, it's been a while since I've read Torah. I don't know if I could keep them all straight anymore. Um, but one of the things that I've done, I have learned a Sephardic trope system. And it was because I was visiting a friend and he went to a Sephardic synagogue and he wanted us to read Torah and I didn't want to be weird. And so I asked him to teach me and he did. And so I think those types of things, um, you know, accent, certainly can get in the way it, it it especially with hebrew with the way that americans speak hebrew there are a lot of sounds that are pretty significant in their meaning and and can really significantly change a word um and so you definitely run into that i think i think the big thing for me is um one my experience with other languages is that the moment you show effort to connect you get a lot of um you get a lot of slack. And so, you know, I, I, I know a lot of people don't like this experience when they go to Israel, but I think there's kind of a, a niceness, a very Israeli sharpness, but also niceness to it, which is when an American starts speaking Hebrew and then an Israeli says, listen, I'll just do, you know, I'll do, I'll do English, right? Let's just go into English. I think sometimes that comes off with a sharpness, but I think it's 
also the person saying, you know, I appreciate that you're trying to connect with me. I think it's going to be easier if you use your native language so that we can process this transaction. Um, I think there is some sweetness to that. But I, yes, I, I think that for me, um, when I do pray in different synagogues, um, I do change my accent. So I do kind of code switch in that way. When I teach in religious schools, um, I do that too. So when I go to Hebrew, you will hear me speaking in kind of a classical Israeli accent. Um, when you hear me teaching in, a, in an American religious school, um, I'm teaching in a very thick American accent. Um, and I have had students who have asked me to do that because they're like, we don't understand you and we can't make that sound. Um, so yeah, I think accent is very interesting. The, the big thing for me is um, there are things that are worth pronouncing correctly that have nothing to do with accent. So for that, I'm, I'm a big um, stickler on when it comes to hearing people, whether they're in a prayer setting or otherwise of like, sometimes it's not an accent thing. It's just not understanding how the language works. Um, but if it's, if it's an accent thing, I try my best to be um, kind and generous and to recognize that there really is no, there's no one in the world who speaks whatever we would consider proper Hebrew. Um, no one speaks it. And, and I actually don't think that over the course of Hebrew's history, anyone has spoken it. Um, and so, you know, Jeffrey Kahn does a great job of explaining differences in Hebrew accents over time. And, you know, uh, I think in our first or second session, we talked about some biblical references that allude to the very, very distinct Hebrew accents spoken in the time of the Bible. Well, I guess um, I just, in okay. my experience, um, if I open my mouth and speak French or German, I don't really have an accent. Or, mm. and, and so people are willing to engage with me, even if my language, um, my vocabulary is, is lacking and I make mistakes. Um, if I try saying any, you know, something in another language, I've just looked in the, the guidebook or I've practiced on Duolingo, um, the brain won't do it after a certain age. And so if I say something in Spanish, it sounds like English. If I say mm -hmm. something in Hebrew, it sounds like English. It's just so obvious. And yeah, um, you know, I know, I know rabbis who have very strong Hebrew who go to Israel, but they speak with thick American accents. And um, they'll be leading a tour. And I've had this with tour guides also, with, with uh, an Australian tour guide who had made Aliyah, with an American tour guide who had made Aliyah. And they'll talk to the person on the bus who, an Israeli will talk to a, prefer to talk to a person on the bus who just has a thick accent, but actually doesn't know Hebrew um, over the person who knows perfect Hebrew, but speaks in an American accent. So well, that's really interesting. Because I, 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 we, we watch all these, I, like, like I, I'm sure the rest of, uh, everybody here, we watch a bunch of Israeli TV shows. And so I don't remember whether it was Shtisl or Srugim or, or something else, but there was an American rabbi and he was engaged in conversation. And, you know, this was an actor um, and it was, um, you know, per total fluency and, and, and everyone was, was responding. It didn't seem to be a problem, but it was, you know, it was, you know, he was identify instantly identifiable as American. Yeah, and it, and there are moments where that can be. Um, I'll be honest that that's there. There have been moments in my experience personally in Israel where, for safety reasons, I I switched accents. Mm -hmm. um, and so and 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 I've done that both ways. I've done that where I've switched into a very thick American accent um, to get out of some trouble. I've switched into a thick Israeli accent to get out of trouble. Um, and uh, yeah, and so you know, it's it's good yeah. to have all of the tricks in your in your bag yeah, when I got stopped for riding on the back of a friend's motorbike in Nice <laughs> I decided to have to, to not speak much French and with an American accent it was very effective you're right but of course yeah. you can hear what they're saying about her or me you yeah right well and that's the other I, I will do that where I will intentionally speak um if I know that if I think that I'm going to get spoken ill of in public in in Israel I will do like a very fake um, bad Hebrew impression so that they feel comfortable talking about me. Um, and then afterwards, I like to remind them that they were rude. Um, but yes, I will, I will definitely do that. And, you know, I also find that even in, in America, friends of mine who speak Hebrew, even if you're around Jews who speak Hebrew, if you do it in an Israeli accent and you talk fast enough, you can talk about someone right in front of their face and they don't know it. So I'm not, I'm not um, advocating you it. You know, be my... careful. Sometimes 
you can be fooled. Yeah. And, you know, I know, I know my, um, you know, I, I always say that my dad is the one in the house who spoke Hebrew. Both of my parents do speak Hebrew. My dad raised us where he took it upon himself to exclusively speak Hebrew to us. My mom would switch off, but usually my mom would go into Hebrew when my brothers and I were in trouble in public. And then that came out really, really handy. And, you know, people would say, oh, that's so cute. Like, you know, you're talking to your kid and, you know, my brother and I would be like, that's not cute. We just lost dessert. Like, I don't know what you, you know, but it sounded so cute. So yes, it is, it is useful and, and, you know, and developing one's accent, if, if you can, will make interactions um, easier. It'll set someone at ease. The, the, even if you're messing up the Hebrew, the, the sound of it, kind of the musicality of it is sometimes easier for someone. Um, and so there are a few tricks, you know, I like to say people focus a lot, a lot on the, on the R sound, on taking out the American R sound when they're speaking Hebrew and rolling their tongue either at the tip of their tongue with a with a resh that's like right in uh, the tip of your tongue at the front of your mouth or doing it kind of in the original Hebrew as a guttural basically where it's a rolling in the back almost like a French R where it's a uh, where it's rolling in the back um, and so you know that's one that people focus on but I also would say that a big part of accent is that which syllable do you stress so in Hebrew you're always stressing either the last or the second to last syllable you're never stressing the first or the second syllable of a long word. That's often where American English speakers will, you can tell. Um, and then other things are just when it comes to like uh, shorter vowels and vowels that don't round as much. So the difference between an O and an O, um, you know, Hebrew doesn't really go into the O where you get a lot of rounding and a little bit of a longer, it's kind of a shorter, more open O. And same thing with A. And there are all of these different, um, E, that you're just getting shorter and less rounding in those vowels. So some of the vowel differences are really interesting. And I think a lot of it has to do also with like your, the way that you just walk around and form your mouth. And so the articulation points are a little bit different. So the, the lamed um, is a little bit, your tongue is more retroflex than in the American L. Um, and so it's kind of, you know, these, these things, it really is something that I didn't realize I was doing until I started learning about phonology and playing around in my mouth and seeing, oh, I am, my tongue is touching a different part on the roof of my mouth when I do a Hebrew L sound from an American L sound. Um, and so, you know, there are dialect coaches who specifically do this. Um, and I'm sure that there are dialect coaches if, uh, that work with professionals who move to Israel to kind of help them navigate that. Um, I am not anywhere close to that, but but it is something, you know, if, if you want to play with accents, you know, those are always good, good places. And a lot of it is, uh, you know, I had Hebrew teachers from all over the world uh, and all over Israel. And so I was hearing uh, Yemenite accents and Moroccan accents and Russian uh, Hebrew accents. And so it was kind of always a fun thing for me to play around with that. And, and disrespectfully, I would, I would imitate them. Um, but uh, nowadays I just do that in private and it is a kind of a fun way of, of playing around with the sounds. But the brain owns um, those synapses. You can teach, probably teach a 13 year old to, to speak with a, na with a native accent, but you can't teach a 70 year old. Yeah, I know there's definitely a, a, an age shift where people really keep their accents, you know, and, and I've also, I, I have a very thick, um, naturally, I have a very thick um, Michigan accent and um, over the years of getting made fun of uh, after leaving Michigan, I have uh, kind of muted it a little bit. So I'm, I've always been a little bit conscious around around accents and, you know, the way I would, if I was uh, sitting around the Passover table with my family in Detroit, I would have said that word is like accents. Um, and I would have gotten a lot of, what was that word? Um, and so I've kind of muted some of, some of those features. Um, not advocating for that. That's mostly just insecurity um, showing up. Um, so here we'll do a little bit of a review and then we'll add really important um, prefixes and suffixes to our repertoire that we haven't talked about. So um, we have talked about the uh, ha, the, the, the hey, that means the, it's the definite article. Um, and you know you can always recognize it because it's either gonna have that patach vowel under it followed by a dagesh chazak in the next letter, or if the letter following it is a guttural and cannot take the dagesh chazak, then that vowel will lengthen into a kamatz, but ha, even in modern Hebrew means the. Um, you have the prefix mi 
Again, you have a Dagesh Chazak following that because you have this liquid letter of the Nun. And so that word is Min from, but when you add that on as a prefix, the Nun is a, a letter that disappears and leaves behind the Dagesh Chazak. And Mi or Min means from. Um, and then we talked about the two Vavs. We talked about uh, the Vav conjunctive, which is connecting two words. It can mean and, it can mean or, it can mean but, or you can even not translate it at all, but it connects words. And that is V, but it will turn into an U if it is preceding a labial, a, a bet, mem, or a pe. And also if um, the next letter has a shiva, you can't have two shvas in the same syllable. And so that turns into an u. So that syllable gets a real vowel. Um, and then you have the vav consecutive, which often biblically is translated and, and, and. You just keep hearing and in a narrative story, but it really kind of, you don't even need to translate it sometimes, but it, it essentially is indicating then. It's a next step in a narrative process. And again, you have that patach uh, under, that a vowel under the vav, followed by a dagesh chazak. And again, same rules as with the ha, with the definite article. If it uh, if a guttural is following it, an aleph, he, chet, ayin, and sometimes a resh, you will not get a dagesh, and so you'll lengthen that vowel. And so this is kind of um, some new ones. Let's just focus on the left column first, and then we'll talk about the right column. Um, so these are prepositions. You have l, which means two. Um, and if you notice, had I not done this so late at night, I would have restructured how I did this slide. But L meaning two, you do have a prefix of li, which means two. And so it's kind of a shortening. The, the li prefix is probably a shortening of L, which means two. Um, you have lifne, which is before or in front of. Um, very common in prayer Hebrew, especially if you're standing before God, right? So a lot of um, the Aron Kodesh in a lot of synagogues will say something like da lifne mi ataumed, like know before whom you stand. And so lifne is that word. Um, you have achar, which is uh, after or behind. Al means above or on top of. Um, when people say el elion, that's the um, elion is like the most high. So the most high God. Um, so that comes Elion, Al, on or above. You have the word Tachat, which is under or below. Um, if uh, uh, anyone kn knows Yiddish, I, I, I'm pretty sure this is a Yiddish word, Tuchas, right? So Tachat, you're under, you're below, your Tachat is your butt. And so that, that turns into um, Tuchas, which is like the, you know, again, with the Yiddish uh, pronunciation, the Kamat, A vowel turns into an O, and the Thav, um, which in my accent just stays um, as, a, as a plosive, but, but it's a toches, and that's toches. Um, and then we have im, uh, which means with, which is different from im with an aleph. Um, and so that's something that a lot of times, again, when we talked about Maimonides being a stickler on pronunciation, um, if the ayin and the aleph mean the same or sound the same, you'll, you might miss that which version of that word is being said. Um, and ain um, can mean not or no, but it's really just a negative. And so sometimes that's not even translated directly, but it's included um, there. So for instance, um, Rabbi Rines has talked about how on our uh, tapestry covering the, the ark in our sanctuary, you have a symbol, I think it's on the top left, which is like a circle with some lines coming out of it. And it's it's a Kabbalistic sim symbol for what's called the ain sof, the infinite. So it has no end. Sof means end, and ain is the negative, so it's the infinite. So God as the ain sof as the infinite. And then on the right hand side here, we have these new prefixes. Ki means like or and or as. It's short for the word. It's probably a shortened version of kimo. So um, you'll you'll have ki. B with a bet means in. Le um, means two. Also probably a shortening of l. You have she, which is probably short for the word asher, which means that or which. Um, you can then double up and kind of give the ke and the she. And so you end up have like kishe ani, uh, when I, right? So it's like 
uh, short for the word ka'asher, which means when. So, um, you know, these are some common prefixes, both biblically and also um, in modern Hebrew. And then we have a very unique to um, biblical Hebrew. You have what's called the interrogative he or the he hasha'ela. And it's this ha that is different from, I'm going to go back one slide. It's different from the definite article um, because you have a super short, you have an ultra short vowel and you don't have the dagesh in this one. And so this is, you might say like hamelech chai. If you change around the vowels so that it had, uh, it was the, uh, the definite article, hamelech chai would mean the king is alive. But if it was this one with this voweling and no, with an ultra short vowel and no dagesh in the next word, hamelech chai is a question. And then it turns into, is the king alive? And so it's a, a very tricky one that a lot of people don't recognize when they read biblical Hebrew is a word will start with ha, which they're taught is means the, but it's the vowel, the, the vocalization is different. The vowels are different there. And this is um, called hey asheila, like the question mark basically. And then the last thing here that I put um, that I just think is worth noting is that you will sometimes, this is, again, I'm using a mem sofit here, but I, it just means a square to mean any of these prefix letters. If you want to say and the, or uh, excuse me, if you want to say, um, uh, if you want to couple these with the um, definite article, hey, um, then, you know, so like la, Sus would be to the horse. Lesus would be just to horse. Lasus would be to the. And it's kind of a combo of le to and then ha, the definite article. And so it keeps the dagesh in the next word of the definite article. It keeps the vowel of the ha of the definite article, but the hey disappears. So, um, you know, karega, uh, like the moment, um, is ke ha rega but then it becomes ka rega and so you basically get the definite article keeps its vowel and the dagesh in the next word so those are a lot of those um big uh prefixes and then we have you know the question words here so lama or especially in older hebrew madua means why me is who ma is what ech is how Efo, or in older Hebrew, aye, is where. So like um, God asks, ayeka, where are you? The ka is the um, second person singular. And so ayeka is aye, like lecha, like you. So where are you? So efo is more common in modern Hebrew. And then we have matai, which is when. Um, and then we also have other suffixes that are worth just being aware of, especially, and it's helpful in understanding the root. This is actually a place where a lot of people get confused or tongue twisted um, with the ha endings, the second person singular, especially if it follows, follows another ha sound. It can be a little bit complicated, but um, what you see here is that I'm showing that the longer word is shortened as a suffix. So li, mine, or to me, right? Li, ani, li, um, just would turn into a e vowel at the end of a word if you wanted to say first person singular possessive. Licha is the masculine and lach is the feminine. And then again, you just take the, the chaf from the word licha and you throw at the end cha lo and la, and this is something that we didn't really touch on um, just because it's not super important, but it is something that I teach people before they read Torah, is that the dagesh in the hay here is a very specific type of thing, and it's called a uh, mapik hay, a mapik, and what that does, it kind of shortens that sound really aggressively, and it means that it is possessive. So the difference between the word isha, isha is a woman, Isha, where you shorten the hey, you get him a peak in that hey. Isha is her man, right? Ha'ish shela, right? The man of hers, right? So instead of Isha, woman, if there's a mapik hey, it becomes Isha, her husband or her man, 
right? And so I think that's something that a lot of people get confused um, with the mapike. They're like, why is there a dagesh? I thought, Yoni, you said that like that sound doesn't get a dagesh. It's not really a dagesh. It's a dagesh that's called a mapik in the hay, and it is showing you that that is possessive. And um, so that's a possessive suffix there. Um, we have, again, the word lanu, which is the collective, um, the plural first person, just turns into nu at the end, um, as a suffix lachem, masculine, lachen, feminine, and lahem, masculine, and lahen, feminine. Um, and then other tricks here that we've talked about, um, you know, when we when we try to determine a root, it can be a little bit tricky because the three letters might not even, all three letters might not even appear in the word. And so one of those are those kind of those letters that function as vowels. Um, we call those the ahoy letters, the aleph, he, vav, yud. Those are kind of weak. And I gave you some common examples here, but for instance, let's just take this one, this bottom right, the yud, resh, he. Um, that the root of that letter, it's an archery term, which means to shoot or to aim an arrow. Um, so if I wanted to say that like someone shot nowadays, you know, like if you said someone shot a gun, not an arrow, but if you said someone shot a gun, you say like, Yarabo, he shot him. Um, but we also, this is the root of the word more. This is, that's the word for a teacher, a person who gives you direction, a hore, a parent, also a person who gives you direction, and Torah, the Bible, because it's supposed to be your instruction. And so a lot of people get confused because they're like, in the word Torah, there is no yud. How can the yud be a part of the root if it disappears? It's because it's one of these weak kind of vowel-esque letters. And so that can make it really tricky to look at a word and recognize, okay, you know, I've got like, you might think that the root of Torah is a tav resh he, and it's like a little tricky there. Um, but yeah, so those are letters that disappear. Also liquid letters, the most common of which is the nun. And so aleph, mem, nun, like the word um, uh, emuna or amen, right? Which is to confirm or to affirm, right? So amen is what you yell when you support what was said. Amuna is faith or trust. Um, but that is also the root, surprisingly to a lot of people, of the word emet, truth. And the reason for that is that that word was originally like ement. You say that a bunch of times, the nun is liquid. It, it, it uh, dissolves, it evaporates, it disappears. And so the root of the word truth is actually the same as the root of the word um, faith or to support. And so it's a, kind of an interesting thing that you get there. Um, and then the last thing that makes determining roots or identifying roots a little bit difficult are these double letters. So the word ozi um, has a dagesh chazak in that zayin. That's one of the key ways that you know that doubling is happening is that you see a dagesh chazak. And that's actually that the root has two of the same letter in a row. So azaz, um, which means strength. And so ozi, my strength, you end up getting uh, one of those two letters disappears. And so the root of oz is actually not ein, zayin, yud. You think it was an easy one to figure out. It's a three letter word. So those three letters are the root. It's actually not And the dagesh chazak is what shows you that. Um, and then, you know, again, these, these keys looking for that dagesh chazak. The dagesh chazak is the most, in my opinion, the most intriguing of all of the markers in Hebrew. Um, it, can mean and tell you so many amazing things. It's basically to me an invitation to see what's going on. And so the Dagesh Chazak can help you determine the Binyan, right? If it's an intensive, like a PL, you'll know, or a heat PL, the reflexive, you'll see the Dagesh Chazak. It can be there for doubling purposes. It can be there for all sorts of intriguing reasons. It could be a letter that's missing, like um, the definite article losing that Lamed, archaically losing that Lamed. And so the Dagesh Chazak, she really pulls a lot of weight and she does a lot of really cool work. Um, and then also just being mindful of prefixes, suffixes, and binyanim, that is going to really be helpful in discovering roots. The other thing that I'll say is that the internet nowadays has amazing Hebrew resources. So what I also would encourage you, if you're trying to find a word and you're not sure what the root is, um, like Wikipedia has a Wiktionary. There are all of these really amazing um, resources, if you can copy and paste into Google, um, you really actually might find some useful resources there. Okay, so I hate this slide just because I put so much on it. Um, but this is an example that I just wanted to use in terms of 
uh, translating something, finding meaning in a prayer. So this is for a lot of people, uh, the first prayer that they might say when they wake up, it's called moda ani or moda ani. The, the change of the vowel there under the Dalet just has to do with um, the gender that you're using for that word. And I, I just typed out, hopefully without any typos, the translation from the Mishkan Tfilah, which I think we're all familiar with. And, you know, the way that Mode ani lefanecha is translated is I offer thanks to you or before you, right? So I offer thanks to you. Mode ani lefanecha, melech chai v'kayam, ever living sovereign. We'll talk about how they get to that translation. Shechazarta um, bi nishmati, that you have restored my soul to me, bechemla in mercy. Raba emunatecha, right? How great is your trust? And so that you can understand kind of all of the things that we've put together, the root of that first word, mode, is a really, really tricky word. It's also a very ancient word. And so the root is kind of creatively constructive. So the root of mode is actually yud, daled, he. Again, similar to how like the word uh, more, which is a teacher, comes from yud, resh, he, and you lose the, the yud and you throw a mem on there and it goes away, like Torah does the same thing. And so here, um, the root, yud, dalet, he, means to throw or to cast away. And when you construct this in the hifil, like you do for the word mode or moda, it means to, to like throw thanks, right? To like throw praise. It's also possible that the, the, the transition from to throw to to give th thanks had to do with an ancient ritual, almost like we do like at weddings when we celebrate and we throw rice or confetti or whatever, that it's possible that you would throw, you know, you like throw your shoe or you'd throw something valuable at someone as they pass by to give them thanks. And so it's kind of questionable as to how this evolved into to give thanks. But this is the same as the word toda, right? So mode like toda or hoda'a. Um, Modim anach nulach is another uh, prayer construct of this. And so mode to give thanks. Lifanecha, like we said in the uh, previous slide, lifne means before or in front of, um, and that cha suffix is you. So, you know, before you. So I give thanks before you or in front of you or to you. Melech, meaning a ruler, a possessor. Some translations will use the masculine, call it king. Here, the Mishkan Tefillah wants to stay gender neutral when they're talking about God, and so they use the word sovereign. And then we have this pairing here of chai and kayam. So chai, like the word chaya is an animal. Chai means alive. It's the adjective of like, uh, you know, this is uh, in gematria, the 18, when people make donations in in multiples of 18. Here we have um, chai means alive and kayam is the word, it comes from kum or kom, which means to stand. And so kayam, um, here you could translate that as enduring when they, the mishkan hanefesh or the mishkan tefillah, when they add chai and kayam together, again, you see the vav conjunctive. So they're not saying alive and enduring. They're just not translating that word, but they're combining the concepts. So ever living, right? An enduring life, right? Ever living is how they translate chai v'kayam. I think it's very good translation, a nice and creative one, and it really shows a understanding of the vav conjunctive that you don't just have to use the word and. You can just connect the concepts there. Um, and by the way, the word kom, right, is like the word koma, is a wall, right? So it's something that stands or supports others. Lakum, right? La shevet, lakum, la shevet is to sit, lakum is to stand. Um, and so that kayam is um, uh, arising. You'll say, you'll use the same thing when the Bible talks about when a new king arose, right? So kayam, they translate here as ever living, chai kayam, combining those concepts. Shechazar um, tabi, right? Like chazar is to return. Um, this is a very common word in uh, Judaism that people like talking about the root of um, the nasham or the nishama, right? So here, uh, nishama is translated as a soul um, and linshom is to breathe. So you kind of makes its way into the understanding of soul by understanding it as a life breath, 
Um, and so kind of like your living breath is your nishama, which gets translated and theologically used as a soul. And again, that suffix of T, so nishama sheli is nishmati, my soul, right? So nishmati is nishama with the T suffix, which means mine. And then chemla means mercy. Rabba is many, great, or multitude. Um, and this is also a word that's used to describe God's many acts and, and grace and all sorts of things. So, you know, um, uh, we, we use that word often in prayer. And then the last word, which we talked about already with that tricky root of um, emunatecha, right? That uh, your, and here they translate it in the Mishkan Tefillah, they translate it as your trust. It can be your trust, it can be your faith, um, you know, but great is your emuna, however you want to translate that. So this is a way that, you know, kind of picking it apart, looking for those roots is really helpful in finding meaning in this. This is also why so many Sidurim have different translations for the exact same prayer, right? You can really manipulate this in a way that matches up to you um, theologically. It can make uh, you can use language like the word sovereign if you want to have like kind of a formalized language. You can have ruler if you want a little bit less so. You can also, by the way, change some of these meanings to make sense in context. And so that's what they did with chai v'kayam. Some other translations might say alive and enduring. And they uh, use a really good use of that vav conjunctive to say instead of chai as a separate clause and then use the word and and then kayam as another clause combining that and calling it ever living i think is really um skillful here in their translation and so this is kind of you know the part oh yeah question no i just want to say thank you for answering my questions <laughs> that's great oh yeah I right I, oh yeah i i always it's always easier when i get a suggestion or a question, it kind of gives me focus. Um, otherwise I'm like all over the place. So thank you. Um, and again, that's a process that we can do for pretty much any and all prayers. Um, but here I just wanted to say, you know, some things that we use um, if you wanted to continue learning and growing here. So you do have um, dictionaries or they all like to call each other th themselves lexicons. Okay. I like to call them dictionaries, but they like the word lexicon. So you have what I grew up using, which is the BDB, the Brown Driver Briggs um, Dictionary. And um, this is still viewed as, I'm sure if you were to take a, a, any course on um, Hebrew prayer or biblical Hebrew, anything like that, they would probably still make this required reading. It is a very, very good dictionary. And um, it was written so long ago that it's a little bit out of date because Brown, Driver, and Briggs did not have the knowledge of the languages that we do now. They, there really is a very tiny section on Akkadian, which nowadays research has really um, uh, improved upon. Um, they, I don't think, had any concept of the language of Ugaritic, which has really been useful. And also they um, missed out on a lot of the Dead Sea Scrolls um, mm -hmm. Uh, discoveries. And so the Brown Driver, the BDB is, is a great dictionary. Um, and there are other ones that I think are more useful. And of course, there are ones that are um, modern Hebrew dictionaries that are not biblical, um, that are useful as well. Those I typically find harder to navigate because they're not always structured around roots. Can I ask a question? Oh, yes, please. Uh, the dictionary you're talking about now is for biblical Hebrew, not for yeah. conversational Hebrew. Right. So it's really, it's, it's biblical and rabbinic Hebrew. Um, they also have an Aramaic section because a lot of biblical or a lot of rabbinic texts um, and also biblical texts like the book of Daniel, for instance, use Aramaic a lot. Um, it is really a tool. It's, it's really an academic tool. It's really a tool for uh, biblical studies, for prayer studies. Um, there's for the Talmud, um, people like to use the Jastro dictionary. I I'm so bad at using, I was going to say I hate it. It's not that it's a bad dictionary. I'm just not good at using that one. Actually, um, I wanted to ask you about a good dictionary for conversational Hebrew and also, yeah. and also an online dictionary. Great. So all of these diction or most of these dictionaries actually are online. So the BDB, as an example, is online. Um, another really good dictionary is called the Klein Dictionary. I think it's written by Ezra Klein, but not the Vox 
and now New York Times journalist, um, just another Jewish guy named Esther Klein. Um, and um, there are, uh, you know, typically when it comes to um, modern Hebrew dictionaries, I don't remember what it's called. I can picture it in my mind, but um, I have a very strong feeling that if you were to look on Amazon, it would be the number one reviewed with like thousands of reviews. Um, for modern Hebrew, a lot of the dictionaries are um, pretty standardized um, because there isn't quite as much uh, academic discovery when it comes to modern Hebrew dictionaries. So biblical Hebrew is always being updated in its understanding. We talked maybe in session two or three about that word tachash, which is often translated as dolphin skins or unicorn or whatever, right? They didn't know until a, a few decades ago what that actually word meant. And so biblical Hebrew, we're always learning more. Modern Hebrew, um, yeah, what I, I also think the temple um, has a few modern Hebrew dictionaries and so they'd be worth um, rifling through. But um, yes, there are, uh, Safaria, which is an online resource of Jewish texts, um, has dictionaries available on safaria.org, and that's a totally free resource. Um, and uh, Safaria now has built into their biblical texts and also their rabbinic texts. They've actually built in, I think, the Klein Dictionary. And so you can double click on any word, um, so long as you're not using the app. If you're using a desktop, you can double click on any word on a Safaria text and it will show you the dictionary definition of it. So very, very cool evolving resource, Safaria. Um, but yeah, so those are- There's also, the, you can just use your phone and do Google Translate. Oh, I love, yes, and, thank you. Then, Google Translate is an amazing I don't know if tool. you can see, here's my dictionary. It's the Shiloh Dictionary, mm. 1959. Probably don't want that. But was still on, I plucked it from my shelf. No, they're great, and, and you know, and, and the truth is, I, the the big thing with a dictionary and why I always, um, before I buy dictionaries, I always like to hold them and and look through them. Is um, if if it's difficult for me to navigate, it's not going to be useful, and that's actually one of the reasons also why, um, Fern, I'm so glad that you mentioned Google Translate. It is so accessible. Um, Google Translate. I have the app on my phone. Um, if you Google anything, uh, if you go to a Hebrew language website in a Google Chrome browser, it will often um, transcribe it for you. And, you know, you just have to be careful of the, it'll translate it for you, but you have to be careful of like some weird translations when it starts getting into gibberish. But usually it's kind of clear when it's off. Um, but yes, so th those are, um, I actually think that Google's, uh, Google Translate is probably the dictionary that I use the most. Um, I also often use it to, to help with spelling. Um, I'm really bad at spelling. So um, yeah, when I was teaching in Hebrew school, I would always pull my phone out of the pocket and I would, um, yeah, either that or I would do talk to text and let the phone uh, spell for me. Um, and then, you know, just other things, a book that I really love um, that I think is so accessible and talks about Hebrew in a way that is exciting and sensical is this book, How the Hebrew Language Grew by Edward Horowitz. Um, I, I think I've mentioned it before. I actually learned about that book in the introduction to a different um, biblical Hebrew textbook um, where the my teacher who taught the biblical Hebrew class and wrote the textbook, he was inspired by the way in which Edward Horowitz spoke and wrote about Hebrew. And um, I really find it's, it's I, I wouldn't say this about any of the other Hebrew books that I read. Um, it's actually fun. It's actually a fun book to read through. Um, and I think he does a good job of, there are good practice lessons in there. He does make reference um, to modern Hebrew as well. And also he knows that he's speaking to an English speaking audience. And so he uses a lot of English examples to describe these Hebrew concepts. So how the Hebrew language grew um, I think is a, a resource. There are some things that I disagree with um, that other books might disagree with his take, but generally speaking, it's a fun book and a good resource. And, you know, the other thing that I would say is Wikipedia is a really outstanding resource. I know that um, when I was in college um, and even in high school, people were um, very negatively uh, perceiving the quality of Wikipedia. I think that nowadays, um, and even truly then, the quality of Wikipedia is quite good. Um, and I do often refer people to Wikipedia pages after I've kind of vetted them. And Wikipedia's pages on Hebrew concepts 
are exceptionally good. Um, and so uh, whether you're talking about modern Hebrew or biblical Hebrew, um, there are definitely things that are missing that I wish were in those articles, but I, 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 have, I have not encountered anything that was flat out wrong. And so um, if you Google, you know, just Hebrew and you go on the Wikipedia page for Hebrew and you can start clicking on verb constructs and all of these wonderful things, Wikipedia does a great job um, of including high quality and clear uh, Hebrew resources. Yoni? Um, oh, yes. Yes. Um, uh, okay, you've got all the, yeah. Um, uh, I, I very much enjoyed this class. I really, uh, you know, I learned quite a bit. I find that um, when I go off on um, Duolingo or some of the uh, how, you know, how to read, how to, uh, Olive isn't enough kind of books, um, I'm not as, I, I, I don't learn as well as if I'm actually in a class. So I want to know, uh, can you continue this uh, some way? And I know it's, uh, you have trouble, I've had trouble over the years getting Sinai to support these kind of classes. So my, my other question would be how much? Yeah, no, so my, so, thank you. I appreciate that you, um, you're that you enjoy. You're, you're, yeah, you get the trophy. Thank you. I, I do. I do love. I do love teaching this stuff. Um, I'll say just uh, personally, my biggest struggle with teaching this class is that I always spend way more time um, preparing for it than I think that I will. Um, and right now we're actually working. I'm working on building a new website for the temple, which is a massive project that also uh, requires a lot of my uh, time and creative energy. And so um, I. I'm absolutely, when I finish the, the website, I'm very, uh, very, very willing to continue t teaching these right now. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm a little bit fried. Um, I understand. And, Just keep yeah, me, no. this on your list, everybody on here. Could you also send all of your slides? Out? Yes, I will. I, I, I will send the PDF. Yeah. And yeah. Um, because if I'm sitting here writing, um, writing notes I'm not catching what you're saying and yeah yeah so. we'll we'll definitely we will leave the recordings you know I've tried to put all the recordings into a playlist um, on Facebook and also on YouTube so that they're easy to go back to and to find um, I will email out um, after this class I'll email out uh, those links but also all of the the PDFs of the slides that I've created um, that's, that's another thing that I know a lot of people thought was ridiculous. I I'm up until like 3am making these slides and people say why. And I'm like, because a lot of the examples that I find, uh, in books and online just aren't very clear. And so I want to make my own, um, but it does your own book. <laughs> yeah, no, but it does take, um, yeah, I, I, I definitely love it. You know, one of the things that, um, I also want to always be aware of, when I work, when I teach in synagogues, especially when I teach adults, is um, when I teach kids, I usually don't get a lot of pushback of being the teacher. When I teach adults or when I pitch uh, the idea of teaching adults, um, I often hear some type of pushback about how I'm not credentialed enough um, to teach or how, oh, he doesn't have, a, he's not a rabbi. He doesn't even have a college degree. I get a lot of that stuff, which I, oh, um, you know, look. Yeah, for, really. If you know, you know more than I do. So you're the teacher. No, but um, thank you. I, I guess your adult students are a little poorly behaved, more poorly behaved than the kids. Okay. Yeah, no. And it's, you know, and I, and I get it, you know, and, and there's, um, you know, there also, I will say there are people in the community who, uh, consider themselves talented um, teachers in things like Hebrew and, and otherwise. And um, I, I feel like it would be impolite to disagree. And so, um, you know, there are, there are other classes that um, we will be teaching uh, at the temple, which will touch on a lot of these topics. Um, I know that Rabbi Susan does a great job whenever she can um, mm -hmm. at teaching her prayer book Hebrew class. She's fantastic. Um, you know, and I think that we are, I keep hearing rumblings on staff about doing another round of adult B'nai Mitzvah classes and maybe, you know, Rabbi Kalman will teach a conversational Hebrew class. And, you know, I think, again, these, these classes are um, not easy to, uh, you know, to 
the, the curriculum, you know, I, I basically had a plan for the whole series before I started teaching week one. And so I think that type of, you know, there are some classes that are easier for me to kind of throw together um, than others. And I know that Hebrew in particular is always a difficult one, but, but I have been talking, I know um, Rabbi Rhines um, has wanted me to teach not only this class, but a couple of other classes on, on biblical topics. And um, yeah, when I, when I can get a, a handle on the workload, um, I'm, I love, I do love teaching. I also love the learning that I do in preparing to teach. So, you know, for me, it's always fun kind of dusting off books um, from my shelf to refresh on what we're doing to try to, um, my book collection is always growing. So also when I started teaching classes like this eight years ago, um, there were books that I did not have that I wasn't aware of that now I get to incorporate. And so um, those are some of the things that I, uh, you know, I do love this stuff. I love the idea of taking something that can be so painful um, like learning a language and hopefully making it fun and accessible. And, um, you know, that was a big change in my Hebrew education was growing up. Um, I had two parents who are incredible teachers. And so Hebrew was, was fun for me. Hebrew was easy. It was fun. It was useful. Um, and then I started taking classes and the teachers that I had were not skilled teachers. And so I was, uh, I have many, many years of uh, bad Hebrew experiences. Um, and then when I got to uh, the high school that my dad actually started, um, so socially not so great, but intellectually um, very useful. Uh, and uh, Rabbi Eric Grossman was my biblical Hebrew teacher. And he was the first person who started answering questions in a deep way and in a meaningful way. And so he was the first Hebrew teacher that I ever had who, when I asked a question, did not say, that's just the way it is, memorize it or get used to it. And so he um, and his textbook really uh, opened my eyes to Hebrew as a language that makes sense, Hebrew as a language that's fun and meaningful to connect with. Um, and then from there, well, we know how college went for me. So, so from there, everything else was, was uh, self-taught. But I, f I found that those, having those foundational tools um, were really very useful. And for me, I'm, I'm very deeply connected with uh, the biblical tradition, um, not so much with like rabbinic Jewish stuff, um, but the Bible has always been a really interesting place for me to play and to learn. And so, you know, the Hebrew um, studies that I do personally also are, are compounded by the critical biblical scholarship that I like to read for fun because I'm fun. Um, and so those are, those are some of the things that I, um, you know, these, these sources are all here. Um, I do recommend them. I don't necessarily recommend buying any or all of these books, but, um, you know, especially online resources. Safaria is a brilliant online resource. Um, my favorite online resource for critical biblical scholarship, which also does include some um, really interesting Hebrew knowledge is the Torah.com. Um, and a, 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 an important figure in that website is uh, this professor, Mark Tzvi Brettler, who along with um, Adele Berlin has, has written the Jewish study Bible, um, which is a really, really powerful tool in understanding um, the Bible. And because of that, because he's a Bible teacher, he's written uh, a couple of books on biblical Hebrew as well. And so those two studies go nicely together. So I do hope that we can, um, you know, in time, uh, continue doing uh, Hebrew lessons and also maybe tie that into some of the, uh, uh, the, biblical, the biblical stuff that I know is, is referenced in our Parsha classes and our Shabbat Torah study, you know, we make a lot of references, but don't necessarily go into depth or explain them. And so, you know, one of the things that I think uh, that I hope is useful to all of you is I hope that these concepts um, make it a little bit easier to engage in the classes that let's say the rabbis teach. Um, and also even just in, in listening to their sermons on prayer and Bible and stuff like that, because I think a lot of um, rabbis take for granted that some foundational Hebrew concepts are not necessarily um, understood. And I also, from experience, know that 
even in a college level setting, um, a lot of these concepts are not explained well enough for a person who understands them to actually articulate it to someone else. Um, so yeah, this, this has been very, very fun for me, I will say. Oh yeah, that's the last slide, cool. This has been um, very fun for me, not only in, um, well, the, the prep work, sleep is more fun than the prep work, but, um, but the prep work, even that was fun, um, but definitely being able to connect with you um, with Hebrew and um, you know, field your questions uh, is always is always fun for me. I love I love being the teacher. I love being the student. Um, and so long as like high quality curious learning is happening, I'm I'm a happy camper. Thank you, Yoni. Yeah, thank and uh, thank you. Yeah. yeah, and thank you all for showing up um, and for supporting the class and uh, for supporting me and teaching the class. It's means a lot to me and it's uh i'm glad that you found it useful and we still have a few more hours of purim left so uh hopefully you know you can find fun ways of celebrating over the weekend uh, and we do have at the temple we do have um other things going on we have a bingo night happening on sunday night um and we have uh some young family programming going on today and on sunday morning um, and then we're going to start, I know it's crazy, we're going to start gearing up already for Passover. Um, and so the holidays just keep rolling in, but hopefully you get to enjoy this one. Um, Very and much. Yeah, and we'll keep you updated. So Chag Sameach, and I uh, hope you have a Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Cool. It, this class has just made me hungrier. <laughs> oh, good, good. Yeah. That's, the, that's the goal. Yeah. The goal is to get the ball rolling. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yoni. This is yes. Fabulous. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Yoni. Have a good one. Take care.